BioBalance HealthCast, episode 236, Hormone Replacement Medical Specialist. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. The Greek philosopher Archimedes is quoted as saying, if you give me a lever and a place to stand, I can move the world. These podcasts that Kathy and I have been doing for the last three years are our search, uh, one of three legs of a search, for attempting to move the world. We have written a book called The Secret Female Hormone that covers a lot of the information that we reference in these podcasts. We do these podcasts, and then we do presentations and visits whenever we have an opportunity, lectures. Uh, What we're trying to do through this process to move the world is to look at how patients can become informed about their own health care and active participants in their quest for better health and longer healthy lives. And Kathy is a specialist in what's called anti-aging medicine. She belongs to a couple of organizations that are now in the tens of thousands of doctors that belong, but they are still in the mainstream medical industry regarded as outliers. Uh, they're, a, they're a new wave, they're touting new ideas and new methodologies and new thoughts that, that there's an inherent resistance against in mainstream medicine. It's kind of like we never did it that way. If if you ever watch the movie The Music Man, uh, the beginning, the opening part of the show shows all these traveling salesmen on a train, and they're all complaining about Professor Harold Hill, who sells boy bands in rural towns, because he doesn't know the territory. He doesn't follow the rules. He doesn't do it the way they did it. And that's the resistance that people like Kathy often encounter when they find Mm -hmm. something new that works, because she is, above all else, a clinician who practices old-time medicine. She takes time with her patients, she interviews them, she studies their data, she listens to their complaints, and then she goes in quest of a treatment that alleviates their complaints and makes them feel better. Medical researchers don't do that. They're a totally different class of doctors that specialize in research and teaching. They're not clinicians, although have some clinical experience in order to qualify. And then clinicians. And clinicians tend to break down into specializations. And that's where it starts to go crazy. So today we're gonna talk about that whole specialization gap in terms of education, cross-communication, cross-referencing of ideas. And that could take us an hour, but we only only take 20 minutes. Yeah. (laughs) So, so, One of the things I want to do to change the world, I mean, the whole purpose of this when we started, and Mm -hmm. it has grown to preventive medicine, but it started with there is no specialty that takes care of men's and women's hormones. There are endocrinologists, but they don't take care of what we call sex hormones. Sex hormones come from the ovaries and the testicles, so there is no specialty. They come from that. It doesn't mean they totally are just just involved in intercourse. Right, it has not, it really sexual. doesn't wasn't yeah. it wasn't because of that. It was because these two these two organs actually produce the hormones that make us male or female. And that's mm-hmm. why they said set it's more like sexual differentiation right. hormones. When we're in the womb, when we're when we're first born, the, the sexual differentiation comes from the hormones that we have, mm-hmm. even the baby has. So that's really where that started. But now when everybody says sex, everybody thinks intercourse. Right. So that's not what we're talking about, although it does relate to that. Right. Because those hormones are necessary for uh, procreation and sex without procreation. But, uh, but originally in medicine, that's what it was about. So there's no specialty that looks at that. And the two specialties you would think would look at that, Mm -hmm. that take care of what we call the business end of of things, would be gynecology and urology. And those two specialties... They take care of the business ends of the sexual organs. Right. Not about sex per se. Uh, They're not sexperts. Actually, the sexperts are psychiatrists, believe it or not, because if you don't get... If you aren't sexually functioning... The way they've divided it up, you should see a shrink, yeah. which I think is... Because it's all in your head. Because, <laughs> well, it's kind of... Well, that's I what mean, they tell people. I know. I mean, it has nothing... Nothing wrong with your body. Nothing wrong you, you with your body. You don't want sex anymore. You're 45 years old. You've gone through menopause, and you've bloated up, and you're like, don't touch me. You know, that's, I'm busy. I have to do the laundry. 
and I don't want to have sex right now. Well, it and does sound kind of crazy, say, <laughs> but yeah, but, but why would a not, woman in that condition yeah, want to have sex? That's true. But the but the reality of it is that's where women are sent when they have sexual dysfunction. And if you look at medicine and you look at the diagnosis, sexual dysfunction, it is in the psychiatry numbers. Okay, yeah. you have to have a number for every diagnosis, oh, yeah. Yeah, you or you can't see yeah, a patient. International diagnostic code. You got to yeah. come up with a number. You have to have fits. a number, and you have to and you have to send it on with for payment from an insurance company or Medicare or Medicaid. So it has to have a number. So that number goes with psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So we have three specialties here that are supposed to be taking care of sexual. Uh, things like either hormones or sexual behavior or anything to do with sexual differentiation, and none of them does. It's kind of like hot potato. Yeah. Well, I'll take care of your uh, sexuality. Like when I when my ovaries were removed, um, I went to an endocrinologist, and the endocrinologist looked at me and he goes, "We don't do that. <laughs> we yeah. don't take care of those hormones." And we study them. We, we yeah, don't take care of them. That's right. We have them all in our journals. All the research is in, in journals, but we don't give estrogen and testosterone. So, I mean, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. But really, the problem <coughs> with you is, they said, you really need to see a psychiatrist mm -hmm. because there's really just something wrong with how you're thinking because you're just old. You're 47 and you're old. You're over the hill. You shouldn't be having sex. Well, then there are those cultural and then, dimensions in, and beliefs that impact doctors too because they're part of the culture you know should women over uh, 40 40 have a sex drive well, should should they i mean do we culturally want them to be thinking about those things and in search of those things the way we classically understand men to be well men are supposed to be but well, of but course but different. in the victorian we, we have, are still in victorian era yeah, so do we, but nobody <laughs> recognizes that. So so the issue is when you're talking to a physician, like I was, I was looking for an answer, right. and they were just going, oh, you're not going to me. You're crazy, so you're going to go see a psychiatrist. I said, I already saw one. I have a psychiatrist for my ADD. I have my own speed. I have my own, I have my own guy, and he said, I'm completely sane, and there's something physically wrong with me. So, you, so I kind of shut him down, and he said, "Well, I'm not taking care of this, so it's hot potato." Here, you go to somebody else, you know. So, so then, where do you go? gynecology. I already knew everything about gynecology. Nobody told me anything about testosterone in my training, and I was using testosterone in certain things. And I had already tried most of the different forms, like creams, gels, stuff like that, did nothing for me. So I, I wasn't. I had already ruled that out. Well, and, and when we were touring around the United States and England promoting our book, mm -hmm. the most common question that we received was, where can I go to find somebody in my town that does what you do? Right. And and honestly, that's a, that's a really difficult question. One of the reasons we're talking about this is that age management medicine mm -hmm. is the specialty now that takes care of hormones from, from sex organs, basically estrogen, testosterone. And that's because... Those are the hormones that decrease as we get older. So they put it in, and they've found that if you replace them, uh, many of the diseases and symptoms of aging don't happen. So, but it's an so orphan specialty. It's an orphan specialty. Because the established, if, if you say, name five medical specialties, there are names people can come up with. Mm -hmm. Cancer specialists, heart specialists, urologists, uh, obstetrician, gynecologists. Well, I can't. I, I go into the they don't AMA, say anti AMA website, yeah, and they say, "What's your specialty? What do you do for practice?" It's not, it's not there. Yeah, I mean, anti aging, preventive medicine, none of that is there. So I can't. I have no label. Mm -hmm. And then by by doing what I do, you don't exist. Then the gynecology, you know, the American College of OBGYN said, "You're not a fellow in OBGYN anymore because you're not practicing OBGYN." Mm -hmm. I mean, my fellowship, mm -hmm. the fellowship of doctors who aren't practicing uh, it, that specialty disappears. It might have disconcerted them to discover that half your patient load was male because most men I know don't go to gynecologists. No, they do when they have infertility mm -hmm. because infer gynecologists, another subspecialty, another subspecialty that deals with hormones and in that's, that's how you get to be an infertility specialist is you are a gynecologist who takes care of men and women and try and tries to help them mm -hmm. get their hormones back so they can have babies. Well, that's acceptable. But it's not acceptable to give them hormones back so that they can have sex the rest of their lives. So, so that again, they don't really think that's a relevant concern. Yeah, I mean, most of us who are well, here even realize that we don't. There's so many systemic 
concerns about aging people having sex. You know, or people go or into young people homes. having sex. I'm sorry, but everybody oh, that too, having that too, sex. That too. I mean, and in many places, re- religion has made. Well, as much as I like religion, an religion has made it. A 83-year-old man in North Carolina that was arrested for raping his wife because the nursing home staff determined that she wasn't capable any longer of giving sexual consent. Informed or uh, and they've been married consent. for like 50 years. Yeah, they've been married for 50 years, and so these outsiders made the decision, and he was arrested and charged and tried. And the judge threw it out of court. So, well, of course, thank God, I thank for, that God for that one judge but because everybody else was wrong. Everybody else has an opinion about whether or not it's appropriate for grandma in a nursing home to have sex if she wants it. Well, everybody has an opinion it? about adolescents having sex too. Same, but, same thing. And you know, it's one of those things where the society has really impacted medicine mm-hmm. and society, society's view of sex as something bad mm-hmm. is similar to society's view as testosterone is bad. Mm-hmm. They've made it a, a controlled substance. That's how bad they think it is, which is ridiculous. And it's our hormone. We make it. How controlled could it be? You know, we don't make morphine. We don't make have, we don't make heroin. But we do make testosterone. It really shouldn't be controlled. But, of course, that's my opinion. In any case, the society impacts this. Mm-hmm. And society is telling us what is right and wrong. So I don't see, I don't see a future in the near future that there's going to be acceptance of anti-aging right. uh, as a specialty taking care of the sex hormones. Well, but that's why you're looking for a place to stand, just like Arthur Meadows. Yeah, and that's I why think we're doing somebody has to look for a place to, to stand. To beat the drum, to make the noise so that more people, I mean, and, and when you started, you discovered this personally, accidentally, incidentally, because right. of your own issues. Yeah. Uh, Which made but me now passionate you about have it. treated literally tens of thousands of patients. No. Thousands of patients. In a 15 close year to 5,000. That's still thousands, personally. <laughs> yeah. And they go out and extrapolate your your information, your methodology. They talk to other people. They say, you need to go see this person. I mean, how many people have you had come in your office that have cried and said, I thought I was crazy? Yeah, Everybody I thought I was crazy or I, I thought I had crazy. dementia. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they, not only did they not have sex drive, they couldn't think anymore. So they were afraid to even tell their doctor they couldn't think anymore until right. they read they my story because mm-hmm. they were afraid, yeah, somebody was going to like lock them up and, or tell them they had Alzheimer's. They didn't want to know the diagnosis. So when they got their horn, their testosterone back, their brain came back and their sex life came back. And then they're, they're like really mad mm-hmm. at the doctors who told them to live with it, that this is normal, there's nothing wrong with you. They're angry mm-hmm. and they should be mm-hmm. because this is being ignored. This is not something that is not out there because all this research that is done on sex hormones, this is done in a specialty that doesn't take care of sex hormones. So remember I said I went to an endocrinologist? Right. So ever since I was treated with testosterone and estrogen and I started treating other patients, I then became part of the endocrine society. I get their journals. Right. I read their journals for the last 10 years or 11 years, I've read their journals every month. And half of the articles in their journal are about sex hormones. Mm -hmm. But they don't take care of sex hormones. There's a very, very few endocrinologists who actually take care of estrogen and testosterone. So they study but they don't use them. They do all the research. Right. All of this research that is funded by somebody that's really, actually, it's wonderful research. And nobody reads it. So as a clinician... (laughs) With a, with a patient load that keeps you busy all the time. And you have to stay current on so many things. Mm-hmm. One way to stay current is to go back to school, take additional classes and workshops. Mm-hmm. One way to stay current is to have... To read your journals. Uh, well, that's where I was going. Yeah. You know, one way is to have uh, like pharmacies come in and give workshops on mm-hmm. drugs and dosages and so on. And one way is to read the professional journal. Mm-hmm. So you are expected as a, a an OB and a gynecologist to read that journal. I'm expected to read the Green Journal, which is the OBGYN, American College of OBGYN Journal. Okay. And I have to tell you that in that journal, right. not only is there almost nothing about hormones, but when it is about hormones, mm-hmm. it's irrelevant. It is it, there are studies, for example. For example. For example. Let in me give one, you the title of the okay. study. Factors associated with seeking treatment for urinary incontinence during the menopausal transition. That's the name of okay, the study so that was that's recently posted. Sounds like something that might be clinical. All they were doing is saying, 
they their study was do women after menopause have pee on themselves yeah if they're black white indian in living in the north, living in the south, I mean, or, it, or different religious configurations. Right. I want to know if the Mennonites were so different who going cares? through menopause. Does that help Catholics. anybody? Did that help one person? We know. know. We know if we're clinicians, and I, I suspect that many of these researchers aren't clinicians. Yeah. That if you don't have any estrogen after menopause, and this is not a secret for gynecologists, if you don't have estrogen, you you become incontinent. Well, wow. because the your your urethra gets really thinned, and it can't close. And even more importantly, if you don't have testosterone, the muscles around it atrophy, and and everything gets really thin and dry. So is that a constant leakage issue, or is it when you cough or when you sneeze? In general, or? it's a con. It's a it's an irritation issue. Like mm-hmm. you have you basically you run water. You hear water running, mm-hmm. and you Deep urinate up. on yourself. You yeah. you are you cough and sneeze. <clears throat> You may urinate on yourself. Sometimes that has to be is a structural issue, mm-hmm. but it gets much worse after menopause. Mm-hmm. So in so what we're dealing with is something gynecologists know. And and treat and, every day. And treat every single day. And then they come up with this study. We'd love to know more about treating it. In fact, there are many studies in the endocrine journal about treating incontinence with testosterone. Mm-hmm. And it works because my patients usually who are incontinent aren't incontinent anymore after I treat them with testosterone and estrogen. So, But that's another journal, and you're not expected to read that no, journal. No, gynecologists never read that journal that I know of. I mean, I may be the only one that reads it, mm-hmm. but, I mean, there's got to be somebody else. But it is, it has all the research, but gynecologists don't read that, and endocrinologists don't do it. So... The, the research that's being done is completely irrelevant. So read one another one in same journal, same, same journal. OBGYN journal. This give uh, us the next. Do you have the next title? I don't have that. That's the only title I pulled. Okay, so there were um, there was another article about mm-hmm. it was a case study about two women who were menopausal, and these women in the in the title it it talks about hymeneal scarring hymen yeah. is the ring that is around the vagina in women before they have sex right. okay so really the hymen's broken after you have sex or you have right. certainly after you have a baby or go horseback so, riding or or fall on a bike or you know yeah. you know it can be broken in other ways but this article didn't say anything about uh, the fact that these people were menopausal and they have no hormones. They so the article was about scarring of the hymen in post yeah in postmenopausal women and right. two stenosis, postmenopausal stenosis, women stenosis and stenosis and scarring. and scarring. So what they did was they looked at two women who had this. They didn't really make mention of hormones having like. They were having sex, but mm-hmm. it was painful. Mm-hmm. So what happens when you have sex and you have no hormones is that your vagina shrinks. It becomes the size of about this, the, a little finger. Right. You know, that's all that you could actually and it put dries it. out, lubrication stops. There's no lubrication, so it can't stretch. So when you have intercourse, you tear. And it looks, I mean, I've seen many of these vaginas coming in as a gynecologist. And they'd have little tears out, like, like a sunburst. Like yeah, they were fishers. Yeah. And so and that's very painful and it makes these people not want to have sex. But what happens when you tear every time you have sex is you scar. So what they were doing was looking at people who'd already done the tearing, the scarring, they didn't take hormones and no preventive measures given. Mm-hmm. They have a scar tissue and then after the fact they gave them some estrogen. Oh, it doesn't work. Which implies to everyone who's... It doesn't work in that it doesn't prevent the scarring and tearing. It does prevent it. It doesn't fix but it. it. Does, yeah, if they've already got If they've it. already got the scarring and tearing, it doesn't fix it. So all they, they came up with is you have to operate on these people, of course. Because mm-hmm. gynecology is an operative specialty. So really, they're always looking for a way to operate on something. So instead of going toward these poor women <laughs> have this problem because no one gave them hormones, mm-hmm. no one gave them estrogen, and if they couldn't take estrogen, testosterone, and they could have prevented this by taking hormones, and oh, isn't this terrible that they even have this? Instead, they go, oh, we gave them hormones for three months in a cream, right? and it didn't work. Of course, it didn't. We know it didn't. It but, wouldn't work because the scarring's there. And so then we operated on them. So, but looking for a place to stand, you say 
intervene before the scarring, intervene before the fibrosis issues. Yeah. Before give they're them having pain every time estrogen, they have sex. Which is a sex hormone. Tearing themselves. Keep their sexual life active and functional and satisfying. Keep their health good. Keep their vaginas in good health. And these things don't happen. They don't happen. So and why are we not talking prevention? You know how to do that. But and as a research specialist, that isn't research. At least it's not research. Those were two clinical studies, though. Journal. There were two people that had been, they were two clinical studies. Right. They just got them too late. Mm -hmm. And well, why is this But it was news? a service of, which, when, you, when you want to do research at the university level, whether it's any university specialty or medical specialty, you have to get funding and approval. There are committees that you submit your research ideas to. You have to do all kinds of documentation. Why is this a good thing? What do I expect the outcomes to be? Where am I going to look? What do I, and then you ask for approval, by, sanction, and you ask for money. The school, by, by the school, by the university, there's, the medical yeah, school, the university, right. who approves it. Right. So what do they know? First of all, what do they know about what patients need? Mm -hmm. So they have to approve it or not. Then you have to go out into the world and decide and find somebody to pay for it. And then you have to recruit subjects and get them to come in and sign waivers and. Right, and but really, that. it's it's that means that there are all these layers of people deciding on what research can be done. Well, so sometimes. And so, really, it's not research from the bottom up where patients are concerned. Patients should be the reason research is done. Yeah, so many people are coming to the office saying, "How? To, why what? is this not working?" Yeah. So I'm looking for an answer. Am I going it's, crazy? It's the other end I mean, of the telescope. They come in and say, "We are looking for data that will prove this point." And the point we want to prove in this case is women with these conditions need to have surgery. Right. So That's what they're trying to prove. Let's go go get some surgery. And you say on the front end it should be more open ended. They should never have gotten there. What complaints are ever? We getting? How do, how are people getting here? Right. And so you know you know why I, you know why I went into OBGYN instead of pediatrics, which is what I had always planned on going into, is because I got tired of the OBGYNs at my university not taking care of the babies the way I would have taken care of them before right. they were born and then giving them to us sick. Yeah. So I said, wait a second. I wanted, so my whole brain works this way. I want to go to the beginning of this. Right. I want to make sure babies are healthy. A healthy pregnancy. A healthy pregnancy, right. healthy baby, intervene sooner, get, you know, like yeah. if you do ultrasounds, inter do lots of ultrasounds. Intervene if you have to. If you see a knot forming in the cord, then by golly, they're mature. Deliver them. Don't wait till something happens. Right. So I was always looking for, let's go back to the beginning and see why this happened. And let's not let that happen. Let's just prevent it. And then we don't have so much work on the other end. So I decided I, I could do more good stepping in before the pediatricians and not giving them babies that were a problem. So at the end of the day, we're having this conversation because we're trying to find a place to stand, to communicate with as many people as we can to say there is another way, there is a better way. Please become open to this individually as people and as physicians and medical society and open yourselves to the idea that an early intervention can prevent a lot of things and avoid a lot of things that we may have treatments for now, but after how much suffering, that's unnecessary. That's right. And and that's that's where I'm always coming from. Find the source of the problem, mm -hmm. find the reason it happened, and st and stop the reason it happened, or, or intervene early so that we, it would even be cost effective. Yeah, go figure. Well, just like the <laughs> argument with elderly people that are in pain and dying about how much morphine should you give them because by God, it's addictive. They might be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're going to die in two months anyway. Yeah. What matters? Yeah. Anyway, that, that's another conversation. That's Come another back conversation. for that one. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.